people often ask me who I had as a role model in my journey to becoming a mathematician. My answers were invariably women I had read about but never met. This talk is about one of these women who lived too short a life in the middle of the 19th century, but in that time shone so brightly that she was called the Enchantress of Number and the Rising Star of Science. Before I start the talk, I want to thank Julie Price, the liaison librarian for the rare books and special collections at Fisher Library um, at the University of Sydney for inviting me to present this talk in the library's Rare Bites series um, and for persisting in this project even throughout this unusual COVID pandemic time. The Honourable Augusta Ada Byron was the only child of Lord and Lady Byron, whose marriage lasted less than a year. Byron left the marriage when Ada was one month old and he never met her again, dying eight years later in the Greek War of Independence as a hero. Her mother, Anne Isabella Milbank, was an unusual woman um, who was fascinated by mathematics, actually. So much so that Byron had named her his Princess of Parallelograms before their marriage. But she came to be very concerned by Byron's emotional volatility and tumultuous mental state during their marriage. And so when Ada was born, Lady Byron made sure that she would be highly educated in areas that would oppose and counter any emotive tendencies that she might have inherited from her father. And this meant mathematics, philosophy and logic played a significant role in Ada's education. There are many, many portraits of Ada. Um, this one on the next slide is from 1832 when she was about 17, a year before she met Charles Babbage. Her surname changed when she married William King a few years later. <clears throat> um, three years after that, he was made the Earl of Lovelace, and so she became the Countess Lovelace. Um, they had three children within a, a period of about four years, the last one being born in 1839. So here is a picture of Charles Babbage. <clears throat> Um, I think Ada was about 18, 17, 18, when she met Charles, and he was 41 years old. She met him through her tutor, Mary Somerville, another mathematical thinker, in 1833. He was an unusual person. Um, he was a polymath who was known for a huge variety of inventive ideas. Um, at one stage, he carried out an immense calculation to calculate all the logarithms of all the numbers from one to, I think it was 108,000, and thereby becoming interested in working out whether or not there was varying accuracy between different tables that had been worked out by different people. He and his friend Herschel undertook to check the accuracies of these tables and found many, many mistakes. Um, and uh, these were actually important mistakes because they were used in the nautil nautical almanac. Um, accuracy was extremely important at the time because of um, navigational issues, um, uh, uh, military uh, usages of locations and also um, predicting of planetary bodies in the sky to navigate by. So um, Babbage and Herschel, his friend, became very concerned by these errors. And um, Babbage was then, uh, I guess, pushed towards thinking about ways to overcome these errors. And so he came up with this totally new idea that um, there should be an autonomous machine which could carry out these calculations and print them autonomously 
so that human error didn't enter into at least the transcriptions and also in the calculations of these numbers. And the engine that he envisaged was called the difference engine. Um, this wasn't the only new idea in his life. He was called polymath for a reason. He invented lots of other things. Um, uh, he invented a way to uh, create small circular holes in sheets of glass without shattering the glass. He invented a device to attach to the front of a locomotive so that it would clear the tracks as it traveled on the railway tracks. Uh, it was called a pilot or a cow catcher. He also overhauled the postal system in England and led a survey of Ireland. Now, um, um, the only thing that he wasn't interested in seems to have been regular employment. He was appointed Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge University for a period of about a decade. Uh, this is a position that was later held by Stephen Hawking. Uh, but unfortunately, Babbage didn't pay any attention to his du teaching duties or to the students under his charge. Um, he was extremely interested in and invested in producing this difference engine, and then later other varieties of his engine, and we'll get to that very soon. Uh, he produced, Babbage that is, produced close to 7,000 pages containing reams of hand-drawn diagrams and handwritten notes uh, on the difference engine and uh, the later versions. But he doesn't seem to have produced or published any uh, papers or books on the subject. Other people did. He spoke extensively. He was lobbying the government to fund the construction of this difference engine. He found supporters by holding soirees at his home. He was independently wealthy. Um, and, you know, these soirees attracted something like a hundred or more people to his house um, of an evening and attracted many, many prominent people, such as the Duke of Wellington, uh, people who became famous later on, Charles Dickens, Florence Nightingale, and so on. Um, so Babbage, as I said, Ada met Babbage in 1833. She went to many of these soirees. Um, and at the time they met, um, these soirees were going on intensively. Um, but it was, he was already running into difficulties. The manufacture of this engine became a very difficult process um, uh, for reasons that um, came down to the standard of manufacture of metallurgy and the standard of accuracy of the manufacturing process, the precision of these um, dials and shafts and columns and so on, uh, the, the precision with which these were able to be manufactured was creating difficulties for his design. And although he received this huge amount of funding from the British government, he received something like 17,000 um, pounds, which is approximately 3 million Australian dollars in current um, times. Um, this, uh, the effort to actually build the difference engine collapsed in 1833. Um, he had a major falling out with his engineer, his chief engineer, Joseph Clement, over the growing costs of meeting those specifications and the required standards. Um, and so the work to build and uh, manufacture a full-size difference engine collapsed. He had a prototype that he used to show in a separate building from his house. Uh, people at his soirees had to trudge through the muddy garden to get to these, um, to get to where the prototype was to, to actually watch it operate by hand cranking uh, one of the uh, mechanisms. And um, so he had to think of something new and it didn't take him long. Within a year, he had a new, very bold idea, 
which was called the analytical engine. This could, in the words of Manabria, calculate the solution of in, an infinity of other questions of mathematics contained within the domain of mathematical analysis, as Menabria put it. So who was this Menabria? Well, he was the author of an article that appeared in French um, in about 1842. Um, what had happened was that Babbage uh, was trying to talk to everybody in the world that he could meet about his difference engine and then the analytical engine. And in 1840, he toured Italy to talk to engineers, mathematicians, and scientists about his ideas. And he spoke extensively there in Turin. And a young engineer, uh, young at the time, Luigi Federico Menabria, who later became a general in Garibaldi's army and also prime minister of Italy, heard his talk and was absolutely inspired by it. So he wrote a report in French where he described Babbage's ideas on the analytic engine as gigantic and that the imagination is at first astounded at the idea of such an undertaking. So by this time, Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage had had extensive conversations and correspondence about the difference engine and the analytical engine. And Babbage suggested to Ada Lovelace that she translate Manabria's report. And that's what Man uh, Lovelace undertook. And this is the first two pages of that article, which is held in Fisher Library in the Rare Books and Special Collections, um, which is the focus of my talk. <clears throat> so um, Lovelace, in fact, ju didn't just stop at translating the article. She expanded the ideas and added notes that she labeled A to G to the translation. The translation itself is just under 20 pages long. Lovelace's notes take another 40 pages. That is, two-thirds of the entire article is Lovelace's notes. Um, and the article, as you might be able to see in the top left uh, page, um, is appeared in a, a volume of Taylor's scientific memoirs selected from the transactions of foreign academies of science. Um, and the first few pages uh, actually uh, undertake to uh, delineate, to outline the various uh, sources of the information that is contained in the article. So what was gigantic? What was so different about these ideas that so inspired Manabria and then later Lovelace? <clears throat> um, as a mathematician, I can't resist showing you what the actual idea is that translated mathematical operations of arithmetic to an algorithm that could be pursued by and acted upon by operated on by a machine. So this is an example that's actually uh, explained in Manabria's 20 or so pages. Let's take the problem of working out the squares of any given integer. So take this column that I've labeled A, Manabria labeled a column A. <clears throat> Uh, if we start with 1, 1 squared is 1, 2, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, and so on. So let's write down those numbers. And if you give me an integer, let's call it a variable integer n, then I would have n squared in that spot in the column. Take the difference between successive pairs of these numbers and put them in a column that we'll label b. So the difference between 4 and 1 is 3, difference between 9 and 4 is 5, and so on. So you put that in those um, appropriate spots in column B. And so at the bottom, where the nth row would be, is the number 2n minus 1, which comes from taking the differences of two successive squares. And then in column C, do that again. That is, take the difference between successive pairs of numbers in column B and write it in C. 
And what you will see if you did that for several entries is that you get the same number repeated. So 5 minus 3 gives you 2, 7 minus 5 gives you 2, and so on. So you will always get 2, even at the nth row of this diagram. And so you've arrived at a fixed constant that comes from taking differences of numbers in the previous columns. And this gives the fundamental idea for calculating the squares. Um, if you take an entry in the last column, let's take the, the, the top row that I've written down in this column and, uh, and add it to the diagonally opposite position, uh, lower than this row in column B, I would be adding it to the number 5. And so I would get the next entry in column B, that is the number 7. I can do this again. I can then uh, add it to the number 9, which is on the same diagonal that I started by going from 2 to 5 and now to 9. And that number, if I add it to the number below that, I would get the answer which comes from I'm sorry, which comes from adding 9 to 16, which gives me 25. That is the next entry that I needed to get to work out um, the square of the number 5. So, in other words, I get an algorithm that starts with the rightmost column. So I add 2 to 5 and then to 9, and I get uh, to get um, 7 and then to add that to uh, 9 to get 16, and then if I add 9 to 16, I get 25. So to do this, I just, um, uh, uh, to do this in the difference engine, I just have to take that tabulation of columns and map it to disks in the machine. So column C comes first, I get the number 2 from column C, and then I add it to the number in column B, uh, which at the nth spot would be 2n minus 3. And then I add that to the previous row in column A to get the last, the next, uh, the next square and so on. So the idea here is simple if you're looking at differences of powers of variables, that is, differences of polynomials. And uh, this simple example calculated the square of a particular number. Um, and um, if you now consider more general polynomials, the difference uh, machine works on polynomials to give you exactly the same idea. So um, what the way Lovelace explains it in her first note is that the particular function that the difference engine was constructed to tabulate is this six-degree polynomial. And the constants, which are the coefficients of each power, can be represented on seven columns of disks. And each disk had nine numbers incised on it in the difference engine, going from zero to nine, and um, uh, to add, what you do is you operate with that column on the next column adjacent to it, and then the next column, and so on. The same way we did with the simple example I explained um, a moment ago. So the reason for the six-degree polynomial is that this was sufficient for the purposes of the time to calculate all the interesting numbers, the important numbers that were used for naval and other um, uh, exercises uh, that uh, governments were interested in at that time. Um, but this, uh, this model of um, the um, difference engine, uh, although Babbage had a prototype that he could use to show to his friends uh, at the soirees, the full version was never completed in his lifetime. Much later on in the 1990s, actually, um, a professor of computing from the University of Sydney, Alan Bromley, 
persuaded people at the Science Museum in London to manufacture, to actually uh, create the full prototype. And they did that. Uh, this is a, a snapshot of that full engine, Babbage's difference engine. It was completed in 1991, I think. At, uh, and you can go and see it if ever you're in London, uh, uh, hopefully soon. Um, so <clears throat> this uh, working model had um, uh, wheels, as you can see in the picture, representing numbers from zero to nine. They were stacked up on top of each other uh, because what you wanted was a way of representing the units, the uh, tens, the hundreds and thousands and so on, or, or the places in a decimal expansion. The machine had eight columns uh, because we needed seven to calculate the six, six degree polynomial uh, and one extra for the for representing or storing the result. It automatically calculates and tabulates that polynomial to 31 decimal places. Uh, but the thing to notice here is that the operations are sequential. One column works on the next, works on the next, and so on. The analytical engine was very different. And this is uh, another diagram from Babbage's time of the conceptualization of the analytical engine. It's never been built. It's immensely more powerful than the difference engine was. Uh, it went far beyond it. Uh, because it was designed to calculate, as Babbage put it, any function, any function that could be represented in terms of an expansion of uh, arbitrary numbers of powers. Um, the, there was a very interesting new idea in here, because in order to operate on such objects, the engine needed to work simultaneously on many columns of digits, or many columns of variables. And to be able to do that meant it had to have a program built, a way of transferring a program built into the design. And what Babbage used as a metaphor, uh, and actually as a simple model, was the way jacquard looms were designed uh, for the manufacture of uh, uh, brocades of cloth in Northern England. Um, and um, the, the whole thing was built on the idea of having punch cards, which enabled dif different groupings of threads to be fed through to the, uh, to the loom at each, t each click of the machine that rotated the punch cards. Um, so uh, in Manabria's article, um, he speculated that the analytical engine might need upwards of 20,000 cards to carry out the operations that were envisaged. But in note F, Lovelace points out that the repetition of cycles can be used to reduce this, um, this estimate of Menabrias. And she said the analytical engine weaves algebraical patterns just as the jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. It's a very beautiful way of putting uh, the way this uh, this machine worked. And um, uh, here is an example of what a Jacquard loom was capable of producing. This is a design of William Morris uh, at that time. But as I said with Lovelace's words, uh, she went far beyond Manabria. Um, in this note F, she also considered calculations that go well beyond the human brain. She said, we might even invent laws for series or formulae in an arbitrary manner and set the engine to work upon them and thus deduce numerical results which we might not otherwise have thought of obtaining. This is like looking far into the future into um, areas like artificial intelligence. Um, I love the way she also talked about other objects that the machine might operate on. In note A, she said, supposing, for instance, that the fundamental relations of pitch sounds in the science of harmony and a musical composition were susceptible of such expression and adaptations, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. 
I wanted to try and explain what she did then in her last note, note G, in the calculation of Bernoulli numbers, but I probably don't have enough time to go into it in great detail. So let me just give you a very cursory overview because in modern terms, some people have called this the world's first computer program. So what are Bernoulli numbers? Well, they satisfy an implicit relation from which you can calculate them recursively. And for those who are mathematically inclined, you can go and look it up. This is one of the formulae from uh, Ada Lovelace's Note G, but also remember that her notation was shifted from modern notation. So in case you get confused, remember that. So what she did was she showed that this formula could be uh, used to produce sequences that could build up more and more and more Bernoulli numbers. So in particular, if you took n equals one in that formula, then you could immediately work out what B1 is, turns out to be one sixth. And then she provides an algorithm to work out an arbitrary number of these Bernoulli numbers, the sequence of numbers for any index n, so that given B1, then B3 and so on, we could work out Bn for any n. In this fold out sheet of the article in note G, she shows how you can work out what she called B7, what would be B8 in modern terms. So um, she talks about having columns, uh, which are called Vs. Uh, you might see the, that in, on the left. I'm sorry that the image is so small, but you might be able to expand it on your screen. Uh, v with subscripts, they denote columns of numbers. Uh, the superscript is designed to explain what happens in separate instances of time as each column is updated with the next value. And so each time you use the computer program, so in, in the case I've encircled there, you can work out uh, B1 um, uh, and then um, uh, um, B3 and so on. So it, you work it out successively and then at the end you work out what B7 is by following each row of the operation in the table. Um, and she also explains that um, the, the efficiency of this algorithm, uh, something that is still continues to persist in computer science today. Whenever you write a program, you're interested in um, figuring out what the upper bound of the number of calculations might be. Um, and um, uh, she explains that uh, only 25 operation cards are needed and no more are needed, no matter how great the index n may be. There are a few small bugs in this program, uh, very type, minor typographical errors, and I've pointed out one here, but uh, it should have been the reciprocal. But um, anyway, these are easily overcome. And as I mentioned before, Babbage and Lovelace's correspondence was uh, deep and numerous. They corresponded and saw each other more and more often. Um, in, um, uh, it's interesting to note that two of the letters between Babbage and Lovelace are actually held at the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney, and you can see it online uh, at the Powerhouse Museum website. Um, in, in a letter that I've taken an extract from on this slide um, from the 2nd of July, 1843, um, um, uh, oh, actually, I'm now talking about two different letters. Uh, from July, 1843, Babbage said, uh, all this it was not possible for you to know by instruction. And the more I read your notes, the more surprised I am at them and regret not having earlier explored so rich a vein of the noblest metal. That's high praise indeed in my eyes. Um, and in this letter for which you see an extract um, of the 9th of September, 1843, that page ends with his phrase for her, her his name for her, which is the enchantress of number. 
1850, Lovelace's health unfortunately deteriorated um, and she passed away on the 27th of November, 1852, just before her birthday in December at the age of 36. And Babbage was the appointed executor of her will. This is the last known portrait of Ada Lovelace, uh, painted in the year that she passed away. Her husband, William King, wrote, the Earl of Lovelace wrote, her mind was invigorated by the society of the intellectual men whom she entertained as guests. She mastered the mathematical side of a question in all its minuteness. Her power of generalization was indeed most remarkable, coupled as it was with that of minute and intricate analysis. Babbage was a constant intellectual companion, and she ever found in him a match for her powerful understanding and their constant philosophical discussions begetting only an increased esteem and mutual liking. What I see in her notes is someone who believed, like I do, that mathematics was our only way of expressing the truths of the universe. A woman who was unafraid of asking probing questions and developing her own answers, along the way developing an unerring instinct for charting new knowledge, and she continues to inspire me. So our first question actually came through um, from, we've had two questions from our Red Books team. The first question is actually from Julie Sommerfeld. She's uh, written in quite a, uh, a wonderful question here. Um, and it says that she's noticed there's an Ada Lovelace Day um, and online network. She's given us a link, which I'll pop into the chat for everybody to have a look at, um, which is an international celebration of the achievements of women in science, technology, engineering, and maths, and aims to increase the profile of women in STEM and in doing so create new role models who encourage more girls into STEM careers and support women already working in STEM. What Julie wanted to ask was, have you personally found any challenges as a woman working in the field of mathematics? And do you think speaking out at events like these can foster real change? Thanks, Julie, for the question. And thanks, Jordan, for conveying it. Um, yes, obviously, my answer to that is yes. And that's why I started um, the beginning of my talk uh, by mentioning role models. Um, the, um, the question of whether there are um, uh, role models for women in STEM, or STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, is a, a long abiding one uh, that many people have talked about um, with the idea that um, if you, you can't be what you can't see. Um, and in mathematics in particular, we suffer from uh, uh, a sharpened problem to do it within STEM in the sense that uh, the higher the seniority level of um, uh, people in mathematics research or education there might be, the, the fewer women seem to occupy those positions. So uh, I do think that that is a, a, a very, very uh, difficult problem that's um, uh, been very long lasting, despite all the initiatives we've had uh, through government and through other bodies in Australia. Um, at the moment, um, the proportion of professors of mathematical sciences who are women uh, hovers around between 8% and 10%, uh, which is a very, very small number in my view. Um, and so, yes, I do think that it's very important to speak up about it and to talk about um, uh, instances of women who have succeeded in mathematics, who have been persistent and very, very good at it uh, throughout history. Um, we've had a, another question come through uh, from Julie Price, who's also another member of our Rare Books team. Uh, her question was, would there be any benefit to constructing the analytical engine now, or would it be just a curiosity, do you think? Um, benefit is um, in the eye of the beholder, I think. Um, so it, it depends on what you want out of it. But in terms of whether you might get uh, 
better computing results or better ways of um, uh, creating computers, then I think probably not. I think we've come such a long way and so far ahead of where people were thinking even in even 10 years ago or 20 years ago that I don't think the analytical engine will outsmart those, um, those initiatives, those uh, ideas. Um, I, I suspect that um, historically it would be a very interesting engine to think about. But I also think that it would be very difficult to build for the same reason that it wasn't built in Babbage's lifetime or even attempted in Babbage's lifetime. I think um, one of the estimates I saw was that it would need 25,000 moving parts. Um, and to actually, you know, um, create such a such an engine would be uh, uh, a little difficult to do. I guess um, for something like that, a question that I have for myself as we, we are um, sort of just waiting for more questions from the crowd, I guess when you're looking at sort of large achievements like that, like the analytical engine, is there something that you see on the horizon, you know, kind of in the mathematics field that you think is kind of that next sort of uh, big endeavor that you're anticipating coming, you know, down the line? Uh, related to computing, do you mean? Oh, um, uh, uh, computing or mathematics in general, or, um, whatever you kind of feel is the most important. I don't know how to judge what is most important because in my experience, the ideas that people come up with are so many and so varied and that you can't tell ahead of time which one's gonna be the most important at a particular time or in a particular uh, application ahead of time. Um, I can give you lots of examples of that, but uh, at the moment, I think probably the most interesting things are happening with machine learning and with um, uh, areas of quantum computing. Um, so I would like to think that um, those are the places which are really uh, going places at the moment. Um, so when people hear about artificial intelligence, machine learning, machine learning is, is the kind of um, uh, framework within which, for example, uh, we're seeing autonomous vehicles operate. Um, it, all of it is built on an engine, which is to do with mathematics. So there are these mathematical problems to do with optimizing um, solutions to problems. Uh, when a car, an autonomous vehicle, an electric vehicle, say a Tesla or whatever is, is um, driving down the street, it's taking in all this input coming in from the many, I think it's 21 cameras or something around the body, coming in, um, looking at looking at the, the signals, uh, looking at uh, what the road conditions might be like, looking at what the other uh, vehicles nearby are doing and so on. There's a huge number of inputs coming in and then it has to decide what's the best strategy for the current car that it's operating to move forward uh, in this space. And to do that, it does um, a, a large amount of number crunching to work out the optimal solutions to particular uh, issues, uh, decision-making for the car to follow. And um, much of that is to do with uh, optimization theory in applied mathematics, as well as statistical analysis of the data that's in front of you. And I think that there's a huge amount to be still learnt and developed in this area. Um, another way to think about it, uh, under the umbrella term data science, um, almost everything we're doing in the modern world is generating a huge amount of data, but the data comes with an incredible amount of structure. So if you look at, for example, um, uh, health data, that might be coming uh, from any particular situation in COVID uh, infections, for example, when, when um, a medical person records the data, there's not just the data about when the person was admitted to hospital or uh, you know, um, what kind of symptoms they were displaying. There's the, the age of the patient, there's the, um, uh, the location of the patient, there's the, uh, the time of year in which this happened, there is, uh, an incredible array of other things that are captured at the same time. So the data set is not a linear data set. There's um, multiple dimensions to it. And to understand what structure there might be in this higher dimensional space of data points, 
that is hard to see by many, many uh, simplistic methods that we might be currently using. And I'd like to think that there's a, a lot to be uh, developed in that space too. So I, I think of these as the, the next big things, hopefully that might happen. Our next question is from uh, Nerida Newbigin, who uh, asked <laughs> that she was curious about the question of passion and emotion. Presumably uh, her mother, I believe Ada's mother, did not educate her out of these faults as planned, but how important do you feel they were in developing her mathematical commentaries? Oh, it's incredibly important, I think, to have an appreciation of something that goes uh, into beauty, uh, into um, a kind of a passionate, to, to have that passionate engagement with problems. Uh, I don't think that I could struggle to try and solve hard problems unless I was invested emotionally in finding a beautiful solution to this problem, to get, first of all, a definitive solution, and then to ask, is this the best solution? Is this the way to understand it? Um, so I think emotion um, is one of the most important things. Um, and I, I often have to um, make sure that when I'm talking to people who, who may not be familiar with mathematical work, uh, I, I try and explain how, how beauty and how my drive for getting to a solution so fundamentally depends on my appreciation of the beauty of that problem or the difficulty of it or my, my, um, my obsession with trying to get to uh, an understanding. And I think uh, probably uh, Ada's mother, Anna Milbank, didn't quite see that. Or, or if she did see it, she saw it as an emotion that could be captured and perhaps tamed by logical processes. But nevertheless, I don't think she could have denied that there was emotion involved in that process. Uh, our next question is from Evelyn G, who asked that Ada's claim that the 25 scorecards would be sufficient mm -hmm. for any number um, n. She was wondering if that um, had been proven to be true. Yes. Uh, well, I don't know that um, I can point to a particular statement of a theorem on that, but uh, the um, that very large fold-out sheet that I tried to show in one slide. Um, I have a, a little print out of it. I don't think you can see it very easily, but there are 25 rows in this table. And this is exactly why she said you will need 25 cards uh, because each card would operate on the, the number of variables in this, in this uh, columns to the right and give you an answer that's then used in the next step and so on. So you don't need more than that because you can apply the same number of cards to a different pair of beginnings. Uh, we, in this table, um, Ada explained it for starting with N equals one and then getting to B seven, but you could start it with N being any arbitrary integer and get to B subscript N minus one or whatever. Um, and you would use the same operations to get there. So in that sense, this table demonstrates that you only needed 25. Uh, now, our next question was from, uh, I believe, Lorna Barrow on behalf of Ross Coleman. Uh, okay. And she's asked, um, Ross was wondering if Ada's work was recognized by the contemporaries of the time after her death. Um, <clears throat> it's, I think Babbage certainly recognized it. And that's why I read out some of the excerpts from the letters that I did, um, that he said that there were aspects to her explorations arising out of questions that he never would have asked or he never would have understood in the way that she explained it. And therefore that it was made out of the noblest metal. Um, so I think that that shows a degree of appreciation. Um, it's, uh, not being a historian, I don't know of all the sources that might have considered what Ada did, but I think that in modern times, she certainly recognized um, in the sense that there are um, <clears throat> these uh, uh, special days now, finding Ada, for example, that Julie uh, posted on, on the chat uh, earlier, 
um, the fact that there are various prizes named after Ada Lovelace by, for example, the British uh, Association of Computing. Um, the fact that I think it's the US military developed a computer language, which is called Ada. So those are kind of implicit signs that her work has been um, noticed and appreciated. But at the same time, I think there are historians who would like to point out that what she did wasn't actually a computer program. And that's fine. Uh, I mean, people have different opinions about how to interpret the kinds of things that she did. But I, for one, think that what she did was um, amazing, absolutely amazing, because we're talking about a woman who didn't have a fo any formal education. She wasn't allowed to go to university. Um, a woman who had admittedly mathematical tutors at a young age, but who invented these ways, new ways of thinking about uh, estimating the number of operations you might need for any particular algorithm, of reorienting the questions, of imagining that there might one day be a, a, a use for the analytical engine where it created new music and played it for you. Um, or that it would invent new algorithms of its own sentient being, so to speak. These are ideas that are far ahead of her time. And these are ideas that are really only being explored in modern society, uh, a lot through science fiction, of course, but also through uh, areas like autonomous vehicles. And so I think that uh, what she did was absolutely amazing. I, I appreciate her. So our next question is from David Roberts, um, who was asking whether you could, um, could you speak to Ada's mathematical education, given she didn't have a chance to uh, attend university, for instance? So she had uh, various people as tutors, Mary Somerville being one of them. Um, and I think she got to talk to many of the other mathematical people out of her time. Now, I don't know how else to um, outline her mathematical um, achievements or education, but I do know that she tried to do various other um, uh, calculations and um, got some way with them. She also unfortunately tried to apply mathematics and statistics that she learned to gambling and lost a large amount of money <laughs> in that enterprise. Um, so, uh, I, I'm sorry that I don't have uh, specific references to put in front of you, David, but um, I do believe that she tackled many other questions in mathematics. Well, um, following on with that uh, idea of um, having other kind of interests in mathematics, Catherine Seaton has actually asked, if Ada had lived longer, are there any indications that she had other mat mathematical interests? Yes, I think so, yes. I think she would have gone on to do much more much more. Uh, and we are just getting close to the end of our time. So we tackle this question. I think there is one more after this one as well. So we'll try to get these ones done and um, if we have time. Uh, so this question is from uh, Cheryl Prager, who asked, mm -hmm. um, computer scientists claim Ada Lovelace is one of them, while Cheryl says that she prefers to think of her as a mathematician. And she was wondering what your view was, Nalini. Well, I'm happy to be labeled anything as a mathematician. So I, I don't mind sharing. I just want people to not forget that she was a mathematician. Um, I think we've got time for one more. Um, and this one, I believe, I can't say, I think it's from Julie Sommerfeld as well. Um, she was wondering what was the reception within the scientific and mathematical community to Lovelace's ideas and her published notes? Was she taken seriously, aside from the obvious relationship of mutual esteem she held with Babbage? Not that I know of. So this is where I'm lacking uh, any knowledge, a specific knowledge about how she might have engendered new ideas in mathematics. Uh, but I, I believe uh, probably the same could be said of Charles Babbage. Uh, I mean, because he was so um, much an inventor uh, and who and somebody who didn't actually write uh, mathematical papers to present to other mathematicians, um, I think um, uh, he was noticed. He he was hard to ignore. Uh, his achievements were manifold, 
uh, but I don't think that they led to mathematical developments as such in the, the primary mathematicians of the day. But I'm happy to be corrected on that. So if there are any uh, maths historians in the audience, I'd love to hear from you about that. Thank you, Nui. I think that's um, the end of our questions for the day. I believe Julie is going to um, come in and maybe wrap us up. Yes, hi. Okay, so if there are no further questions anyone wants to ask, um, that was absolutely fascinating, Nalini, and um, it just remains to uh, invite everyone to thank Join me in thanking Professor Nalini Joshi for her time and expertise, bringing a spotlight onto Ada Lovelace and the significance of her work contributing to the field of mathematics. It's been terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.